Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Very welcome to the latest in our series of webinars, Micro Generation, the, the Future of Solar. I suppose when you look at the scenario today where the cost of energy is, is going through the roof and energy security is an issue, there's no doubt the idea of farmers being able to produce their own energy is front and central. Equally, the scenario as regards farmers, the big debate on the, on the environment that there has been for the last number of months. And every time I, I get involved in that debate, farmers tell me that they want to play their part. And in so many ways, they can play their part if they just let. And I suppose a micro generation producing solar energy from their own farm sheds is central to, to that in their minds. And so we thought maybe today we could have a look at solar energy and uh, uh, micro generation in particular of, of solar at farm level and see what the issues are, what the pitfalls are, what we need to do to get, to get it right. So I suppose we want to know how, how do we get started and what are people's options. I have three guests with me here today. Uh, first up, we'll have Conal Bulger, CEO of, of Irish Solar Energy Association, who look at the regulatory side of it, if you like, the policy context of both, I suppose, at national and perhaps European level as well. Then we have Ruby McCarran, Net Zero Profile Manager with Board Gosh. Board Gosh have actually uh, got a number of farms where they have test systems out on farms at the moment. And maybe there's some learning from them test systems or, or what would be the ideal system in different types of farms that Ruby might be able to tell us about. But really about the practical, if you like, the, the nuts and bolts or the, the kit and, and uh, how, how best that could be set up. And finally, we'll have Geraldine O'Sullivan, Senior Policy Executive with IFA, who's going to look at it from the policy perspective, if you like, or the issues that are coming on at farm level. Anything from questions about, do I need planning commission? Can I supply into the grid? There's a number of questions, a number of issues that are constantly coming up uh, among farmers to, to discuss our, our, our issues that need to be raised. So anyone who's been on, on the like of our webinars before knows the drill. Basically, I will give each, each speaker five minutes to make their opening pitch, and then we'll move over to an interactive debate between the, 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 the three speakers and myself. Uh, everyone is welcome to put questions in on the chat to add to, uh, to, add to the conversation. Uh, we'll, we'll, I'll take the questions from the chat and put them to the three panels. So please feel free straight away if you have to put questions on and when the three speakers are, gone, uh, are finished, we'll go, to, we'll go to those questions. So let's get straight at it, I suppose, straight over to Conal Bulger, CEO of Irish Solar Energy Association. Thank Conal. You. Thank you very much, Colm. Um, I suppose like the context, really have been asked to talk a bit about the kind of national regulatory and policy framework and kind of 2022 is a year where we've seen a lot of change. So I thought what would be helpful is just kind of highlight some of the key changes across three areas, really, kind of the, the supports that are, com that are coming out, planning, um, changes that are emerging there and on the grid side as well, because they're three common areas. Um, and the other speakers will probably get into the kind of nitty gritty of some of them. It's probably worth noticing like this, this area has never gotten this level of focus in Ireland before. And obviously there's, there's climate uh, considerations driving a lot of it. And it's also the kind of consumer exposure to energy prices. Um, you know, I think the stat we've all seen is like gas prices are 1000% increase from uh, you know, months ago, we're kind of seeing, you know, and that's leading to like feeding through to electricity prices. So we'll talk a little bit about how some of the there's policy measures coming through on the solar side that should hopefully help people. And I'll kind of focus it a bit on the farm side. So kind of talking briefly on the kind of support side in the first case, there's kind of two streams. One is the kind of residential bit, which is kind of the, you know, for your farmhouse. And the other is the non-residential on the shed side. So in the residential side, we're seeing uh, the micro generation support scheme is finally up and running. Uh, it was consulted upon uh, back in 2020 initially. Um, and where we're seeing really uh, the kind of elements of it are, firstly, there's an upfront grant. So that, that's up to the value of 2,400 euro, depending on the size of your system, but that's what it caps out as. There is an export tariff, where if your system's registered with ESB networks, your uh, electricity supplier offers you payment for your export. That's capped at about 20% uh, of, of your um, failed generation. And the tariff is about 14 cents to 20 cents per kilowatt hour. So it's probably close to like half the wholesale price in a lot of cases. Um, and then the kind of the third tranche really is your energy savings. So, you know, the energy you're generating there, um, it, uh, the kind of, the payback period we're seeing has really come back on kind of domestic solar installs. Um, Mari did a piece of research recently for ourselves, and they were suggesting within that that 
a residential solar system is paying for itself in about seven years, which kind of is probably around the range, which is a big change from previously. On the non-residential side, then, in terms of sports available, we're probably clearer on the structure than on the level, the pricing level. So that's... <laughs> So in terms of if one of the questions is how much is this going to be, the answer is we're not sure. Um, so the you'd be kind of eligible there for a clean export guarantee, which is a bit like your export tariff. There are some upfront grants coming through, but they're still kind of comparable to the level of the domestic grant. So kind of in terms of relative to the scale of the system you're likely to be looking at in a non-residential setting, probably doesn't quite move the dial, but it's it's helpful. Um, what this is going to be structured at around a, a basically a premium on top of that CEG, and essentially that's going to be reviewed regularly. We don't know how often that's going to be reviewed. We don't uh, know the exact level, as I mentioned before. But uh, the theory behind it is what they're trying to do is if there's a viability gap, close that viability gap for people looking at it. Kind of moving on to planning then. Um, what we're seeing is that the legislation, we understand the legislation is going through the final stages right now for planning. So for rooftop solar and the residential side, that's going to be planning exempt from once that gets signed into law. Previously, it was it was 12 meters squared, then you had to get planning permission. On the non-residential side, what they've done is they've created these 43 solar safeguarding zones. Um, that's really where they've drawn a three kilometer radius around a small aerodrome, like a helipad at a hospital and five kilometers around larger airports. What that practically means um, is that if you have a system bigger than 300 meters squared, so that's something like around about 60 kilowatts, say, um, you're going to need to go through the planning process if you're within one of these solar safeguarding zones. In the consultation, that was 60 square meters, so that's quite an improvement, though we're a bit concerned about the precedent it creates. And finally, we come to connecting to the grid. There's some positive move but here, but probably a bit more to be done. If you're installing in the home, you go through an inform and fit process. That's literally, you tell ESB networks you're going to do it. They have a period of time in which to object. And then if they don't, off you go. They're on the kind of what they call mini gen and small scale generation. So mini gen is kind of uh, 17 uh, kVA up to 50 kVA, which is probably where most kind of sheds are likely to drop into. Um, they're basically going through a pilot. So they're releasing spots that people can apply to connect and go through that process. Um, if you're a bigger, probably a, a larger piece, you, you fall into this small scale and that's similarly a pilot. So while it's good to see that they're finally giving a route to connect, it's probably a bit concerning they're still pilots and they're rationing it out relatively carefully. And we're, we're kind of waiting to see how quickly things progress through all of that. So I suppose what we're seeing is there's a lot of policy prompts coming through. The effect of them, we kind of, we're still waiting to see. But all I can say at the minute is that in terms of the perspective, my members are doing a lot of the jobs, they're out the door busy. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much for that, Connell. Uh, I think that does, does give us, as you say, an overview in terms of the support, the planning, and if you like, the scenario as regards, I suppose, a, a contact with the with the grid, the grid operators and the like. Just moving on to Ruby, we'll come back to questions. As I say, and put the pitch out there again. Be sure to put your questions in and we'll deal with them when we get when we get this finished with the speakers. Next up is Ruby McCarran, Net Zero Profile Manager with Board Gosh. And I might just say at this stage, Ruby has a very busy week this week. She's getting ready for a, <laughs> ready for a wedding. So she's been very good to take off from that the most important thing in her life, no doubt. <laughs> and to meet us here today. So uh, listen, thanks, Ruby, and uh, over to you. Thanks, Colm. Do you have got to now? Um, so as Colm mentioned, I'm the Net Zero Portfolio Ma Manager within the Services and Solutions segment at Board Gosh Energy. Um, I joined Board Gosh Energy recently with a passion for the environment, and I see the power of energy companies and the skill sets that we hold as critical to solving the climate crisis and the challenges that we're facing in the near future and actually the present. At Board Gosh Energy, um, our journey towards a sustainable future is our strategy, and we are determined to deliver a better way for our customers to live sustainably, simply, and affordably. A major focus for us at the moment, and something that I'm extremely passionate about and excited for, is our ambition to decarbonise rural Ireland and the relationship we are building with the IFA. The ultimate goal is the delivery of a targeted one-stop shop partnership, 
which will offer cost and energy effective solutions to both farmers and their local communities. We have the largest services solution and business in Ireland to succeed in this partnership, offering net zero solutions to rural Ireland. This journey was kicked off in the last few years by a study undertaken to examine opportunities for farmers in the renewables area. On the basis that any commercial offer was required to be available to all farmers, regardless of size, sector or location, it was agreed that we'd look more closely at a small scale rooftop solar proposition in the first instance. Subsequently, we've worked in collaboration with the IFA and partners to deliver 10 proof of concept PV installations on, so sorry, solar PV installations on Irish farms. At the outset of the project, looking at costs, an average, an average installation cost was estimated to be around 1500 euro per kilowatt. This has varied slightly in practice across farm types. For example, a small installation of six kilowatts has costed on average around 1500 euro per kilowatt and the more significant installations of 40 to 50 kilowatts more suited to pig farming are approximately at about a thousand um, euro per kilowatt. So while pricing consistency from a solar array size perspective has been seen from our learnings, we've established that setting a price per farm type that's not actually appropriate due to different requirements and challenges faced and that are specific to each farm. When the business case was looked at around two years ago, the payback was estimated to be between nine and 15 years, varying with scale and farm type, and that was without a grant. Now we look at it with the benefits possible from the availability of grants and other factors, and we've estimated that this is actually closer to five, sorry, from between five to eight years, which is a little bit more reasonable and better business case. Um, this is likely to reduce still with the price of electricity at the moment. However, as this doesn't include the cost of batteries, which are more suitable to certain farms, such as pig farming and dairy, robotic dairy farms, um, higher, higher battery increases prices increase the payback period to make and that makes the business case a little bit more challenging. So the main aims for the project overall was to prove the delivery capability for us and understand what an installation might comprise for the different farm types. We wanted to determine what the barriers to entry were and what the appetite and funding was on both sides so the farmers ourselves including ourselves and the IFA. I'm just going to go through some specific examples of challenges that we did see on some of it, on some of these farms that we've already delivered or that are currently in delivery. So one specific example from a traditional dairy farm is one that I find to be the most interesting and really exciting as it demonstrates the opportunity available. The farmer currently has an ice making and water heating process active at night to take advantage of, a, of cheaper electricity rates. However, with the solar PV installation, the farmer is now planning to move these processes to the daytime to take advantage of the free electricity that's being generated by the solar PV. This demonstrates how farmers are able to adjust their business model and operational processes to make the most of what is possible with solar PV. Another significant finding from our work has been that on average, the installation size sought or deemed most suited to farmers was larger and has been larger than what was calculated as optimal before we kind of went into actual live installations. For example, the optimal, optimal size for a traditional dairy farm was estimated to be between six and 10 kilowatts, but actually what we found is it's more suited to 20 kilowatts in practice. So this increase may be due to the interest and enthusiasm of early adopters to solar PV, and it may increase as we scale up but we've definitely established that there's no one size fits all model. The ancillary works required on farms has also been variable. No two installations have been the same. Each one has thrown up different challenges. Each farm will have different requirements and the expectation should be set early on. For example, if we arrive on the farm and the roof, which looked okay from a desktop survey has asbestos or isn't the right profile, this could block any progress. And with asbestos, it definitely would. On one farm, the electricity connection was located in a shed that was unsuited to solar PV, and then it needed to be moved to another shed that was suited, and this required a trench to be dug, dug up in the farmyard, which again couldn't have been predicted at the start. And another thing that we found is that the importance of data to the farmers has also emerged during this project. We've seen that these early adopters are really interested in what impact the solar PV is having on their consumption profile. However, if you don't have internet connectivity or mobile signal on the farm, access to regular reporting that people are looking for is really hindered. And it's something that we would need to consider going forward. And finally, the interest in selling and energy to the grid, as Connell touched on, through a feed-in tariff for microgeneration is a common query that arises, so it's a question that's asked again and again. Currently in Ireland, the most economically advantageous use of export energy from solar PV is to consume it on site. 
And while this is while it is possible to export excess energy from a farm to the grid, selling to another party, so for example, board gosh energy at 18 cents per kilowatt hour, the price is less attractive and significantly lower than the avoided import price. If we were able to make it more economically viable for larger farms, so those 40 to fill up 50 kilowatt installations, a higher proportion of electricity generated may still be economically beneficial for export, capturing additional value from excess electricity. So these are things that we need to consider as we move forward and kind of build out our business case. I know Geraldine is going to touch on the more specific blockers to farmers from a funding and um, systems perspective. So just to thank you all for listening today and we'll be looking looking to launch the project more widely in 2023 and I'm really looking forward to continuing work with the IFA and the farming community more broadly. Thank you. Thanks very much Ruby and now I suppose we're over to Geraldine O'Sullivan, Senior Policy Officer with I, Executive with IFA. Like Geraldine I know myself and indeed yourself and many in different uh, farming circles get the same questions essentially all the time in terms of the, uh, the roadblocks that farmers are facing. Maybe you'd take us through some of them if you can. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, thanks very much, Colm. I think it was a, a very good lead in and I will be touching on what the previous speakers have said. And I think the work that's been done by IFA and Board Gosh on the proof of concept and, you know, this is what, you know, delivering and understanding the real blockages. So some of them we know from a policy and then we're seeing the practical blockages that Ruby would have gone through there. So it's, it's, it's a hugely interesting um, uh, project that's ongoing there. As you mentioned yourself, Colm, um, farmers very much want to be central in this energy transition that we're going through. Um, they recognize the opportunities offered by solar and micro generation to, uh, for their own use, uh, to improve the resilience of their business and also to diversify the income by selling the excess to the grid and therefore enhancing the sustainability of their business. They very much want to be involved in, in this transition. Um, Ireland's adoption of renewable energy technologies at farm level is actually very low. It's at 2.6% compared to a European average of just over 12%. So this demonstrates the clear potential there is for us to increase the adoption of renewables and the scale at which we can improve the adoption of renewables at farm level. Rooftop solar provides a very positive route for farmers to support climate action and improve energy security. Um, there have been, and I'm very welcomed in recent time, changes that are starting to address the barriers to uh, farm scale adoption. Connell touched on the microgeneration scheme there, which is, is, is welcomed, but the cap on exporting it is affecting the viability of some projects. So that is an issue. So that, that the microgeneration support scheme intends to install a capacity of 380 megawatts, which is the equivalent to 1 million solar panels on approximately 70,000 buildings. But as of now, with the cap on the exporting, um, we're seeing that we're, some of the farm projects will not be viable and this needs to, to be looked at. Recently in the budget, um, there was an announcement that the TAMS, the Targeted Agriculture Modernization Scheme, the budget will increase to 90 million. And that is to fund on-farm renewables and this subject to approval by the Commission. And this is very, very welcomed. This additional funding will support the increasing of the grant to 60%, something that IFA have been looking for and has been announced previously by Minister McGonagall. logue And there will also, similar to less under the TAMS, there'll be a standalone investment ceiling uh, of 90,000 per solar. So you can, you'll be able to spend that specifically on solar investment on your farm, while you can still invest through TAMS on other elements um, so, so that is, is, is an important uh, development that has just been announced. Another very important and I suppose step has been that farm dwellings are now eligible for inclusion um, under the solar investment under TAMS they had previously been excluded and I know that that was causing um, frustration you know about the impracticality of that at, at a farm level so that is is being addressed in these changes now we are waiting for further clarification and that will come we also hope that the size restriction under TAMS will be removed it's currently at 11 kilowatts and as Ruby said you know that there the, the proof of concept work that IFA is doing is showing that 
you know, there, there's a demand for larger scale. And particularly now when we have the, the farm dwelling included, we'd hope that that size restriction will be addressed as well. The restrictions on planning are huge, that it does take another their cost away um, from looking at solar and it's all about minimizing the costs so we're very much looking for that planning commission requirement on rooftop solar which is expected imminently to be introduced so that is a very positive development um, in relation to I suppose what we need more I suppose there are still within TAMS limitation okay the grant has been increased to 60 percent farm dwellings is now included but under the scheme and under the rural development regulation, farmers are not permitted to um, export uh, excess energy. Uh, when the pillar of our energy policy is about energy efficiency, to have such energy inefficiency in schemes, um, it, it's, it's not a good policy. And we'd very much like to see that the excess energy produced on farms and farm buildings would be allowed to um, be exported under TAMS to, to the grid. As Ruby said, this is something that farmers want. It's another income stream and it improves the efficiency and the viability and the scaling up of solar on farms. Uh, there may be issues with this and we need to look at if there are issues, then we need to look at a dedicated small scale solar generation scheme funded elsewhere to allow, we need the scheme to be optimizing the energy efficiency. The grid and meter connection still remain a major barrier um, to the to solar development projects. The challenge getting grid connection um, is a major deterrent to delivery of on-farm projects. As Connell said, look, there, there are some changes and, and that is very welcome, but we do need to see significant investment in the redesign and a new infrastructure if we are to, uh, to meet our renewable targets um, for on-farm projects and the wider renewable targets. So that is essential and we need to see a plan in place and we need to see, you know, even if we see initially them focused in areas where projects are taking place, but we need to see that design and that commitment and that visibility and transparency. We also need additional um, simplification of access to grid for smaller projects. It needs to be a much more transparent process and it, it needs to have a reduced cost and we know, need to know the, the grid connection timescale. This will all increase uh, the rate of success of projects. Um, as Ruby said, and something that IFA is looking at, this one-stop shop, farmers are interested. We're getting an increasing number of calls from farmers, but it's like, who do I go to? What, what do I do? That independent information on solar technologies, the grants available, the systems, and all of that. There is a huge kind of information gap that we are trying, that we are in process of addressing, but it is something that farmers are very much interested and they want to look and scope it out themselves and what's the viability and they're looking for that independent guidance. But very much, look, this is, as, as it was said at the start, farmers very much want to be part of this renewable energy transition. It, it's vital that we support them in, in being involved and decarbonizing the rural economy um, and remove those barriers so that we can lead in, in this area. Thanks very much, Colin. Thanks very much, Geraldine. And I suppose we'll just get into the conversation of it all now and hopefully all three uh, speakers can, can join us in this conversation. There is a number of questions in already and hopefully there'll come more in. But just to start with, I suppose, uh, Daniel Brown has put in a question around the size. I suppose he's put it in the context of planning. But equally, uh, Ruby, from your perspective, in the context of the appropriate scale you mentioned, maybe originally the thinking was six to 10 kilowatts on a dairy farm, and now they look, you're talking more like 20. Just in the context of both planning and in the context of what the need might be, let's say a typical dairy farmer, or tillage farmer, that can maybe yourself and Connell both give us a little bit of perspective in terms of what you think people should have in their mind or farmers should have in their mind in terms of what size they should be putting, putting on their farm sheds or what should be aiming for um i can go first Colonel, if that's okay with you that's okay yeah i think i think basically again what i was saying around every farm will be different so recommending something for a dairy farm of a number of a specific herd or however they operate based on are they robotic or are they traditional dairy will have an impact 
the dairy farms that we're looking at that were around kind of 17 to 20, they were dairy farms that were traditionally operated. So they didn't have robotic dairy and their profile was obviously to use a lot of the electricity during the day. Um, the, the kind of, I guess the optimum thing there was what was found to be was the 17 to 20, but that will always depend on your roof size. It will depend on, you know, the access to your roof, what the kind of, what the roof is capable of withstanding, what, what you're willing to, I guess, pay towards the system there, there is no one size fits all solution and our, our from our perspective for example if we were to come out to a farm and we were to assess it we will do we will kind of we can develop different options with a battery with a bat without a battery so you and, and we can kind of show you what that can do for you and um, we're also we're also kind of working with our smart metering team to understand how can we present that to you in the best way what data are you interested in seeing and how can you manage your consumption from the day so it would all be quite bespoke and tailored to each farm and one question in relation you just mentioned the notion of a battery like would a dairy farm where let's say the milk traditional as you mentioned the traditional model where the milking is in the morning and the evening the sun just like shines in the middle of the day is the battery a central part of that is the battery for short-term storage or longer-term storage or is it central part of that and I suppose the second question you talked about that 70 to 20 kilowatt when you talk about them with those farms are you talking about 100 dairy cow farms 200 dairy cow farms what typically are you talking about just to get a sense from memory the, we're looking at 100 dairy um kind of herd of 100 um the the battery case the battery case doesn't stack up as easily as without a battery. Batteries are extremely expensive. Lithium, which is what kind of is used within the battery, has doubled in price in the last year. We know that the global supply chain is fluctuating and changing daily at the moment. Because we're Borgosh Energy, a part of Centrica, so at a group level, we do have the buying power for it to kind of deliver on economies of scale. However, it's something that we still see as expensive and it does make that business case more challenging. So that's something that will change and we'll just continue to look at it at a group level to see what can we do to make things more affordable for our farmers. We're and in terms of, if you, if you, just, just one second, I'll come to you then, Con. In terms of if you don't have that battery, what is the scenario? Are people dumping energy or what is the scenario as regards that? Or is it about hitting your hot water or what's the... That, that is a possibility. It's really variable. So, for example, on one, I think it's a poultry farm, so it's about a four kilowatt installation. They're actually using 99.9% of the energy that they're producing. The system is probably undersized, actually. You, you can, if you're using all the energy that you need in the day and you're getting it all from the solar panel, which will change over the year, it's not going to be consistent throughout the entire year, you'll be able to sell some back. It's not as commercially viable as using it in the night, but it's still, I suppose, at this stage, better than nothing having a battery and having a commercially viable battery within your system is the kind of, I guess, the pièce de resistance. <laughs> but at the moment, selling whatever you're not using, even though you probably will use a lot of it in the day, is, is the most kind of, I guess, realistic um, option for a lot of farms. Connell, sorry, were you? Yeah, Connell, if you're just on that, and I suppose equally the planning piece, if the model that, that a Ruby talks about is typical, how does that fit with planning for people as well in terms of... Uh, so I think Ru Ruby's uh, bang on when she talks about like there's no size, uh, no uh, one size fits all here. Like it's, it's very important to work with reputable suppliers and make sure that you have, um, we'd usually recommending a little bit of shopping around as well, just um, in terms of just making sure you're getting your best interests um, represented. In terms of, you mentioned heating the hot water, that's that's something we've seen done to date on some dairy farms, like definitely kind of, you just, you, it, it's, it's also what happens in a lot of residential settings, people just divert the the the, you know, the the energy into their hot water and store it, and obviously it can help with the dairy farms. It probably reflects though that with the limitations that have been there historically in terms of exports and things like that, people have probably built smaller systems that will be ideal for their energy usage. So, you know, I think the... The new reality is likely to be that the systems are going to get bigger when people have a little bit more discretion on what they can and can't do. Uh, I think Daniel asked a question about planning on land as well. Um, so we haven't seen the full detail. We haven't seen the fully detailed legislation yet that's changed on the planning exemptions. Um, so we've been kind of a bit dependent on uh, feedback from the political classes on what it does and doesn't say, um, but. In terms of the on on because I know we said it was three hundred meters squared on the rooftop, we understand that the land is going to be about the same. So you could have a ground mounted system, maybe somewhere on you know if you have a small field near the near the back of a shed or something, that might be an option as well. 
Um, again, always worth kind of getting some suggestions from uh, kind of an expert supplier. And the 300 meters squared, what would that typically generate if it was in the most appropriate location? Yes, guesstimating you're probably talking a 60 kilowatt system. So I know like we, I think like, um, I can't remember the exact numbers we used earlier, but like it would be probably in excess of what a lot of farmers would be looking to put on their farm. So it should mean that in most cases, farmers don't have to go through the planning process once it's signed into law and assuming that that, that stays. <laughs> and how far away are we from that in terms of, obviously, you, you're not, you can't predict legislation, but you're looking at sort of months, really, is it? Or? Uh, no, Minister Burke was in an Oireachtas committee last week saying he'd like to sign it into law this week or the week after. So it should become a, sure, uh, if I'm taking him at his word soon. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's, I think that message, like the 300 metres is more than enough for people. Planning is coming that it will be allowed to happen. So in terms of that issue, you would imagine that, the, the, let's say, the, the, the sizing and the planning issue should, from a farm perspective and indeed yeah. from a house perspective, just to come with, the, with that on the house side, mm. what, just to, very quickly, what's what's typical scale for a house that's appropriate for, for a so three-bed house yeah, so to date, what people did a lot of times, people want to, people who avoided wanted to avoid planning requirements built smaller systems. So you know you'd have built a two point four kilowatt system, which is kind of just within the kind of the twelve meters squared. Now it turns out there's a fair number of systems out there that weren't necessarily registered or probably weren't quite in line with the planning, um, and that's going to be something that we're all going to have to kind of work through a small bit. What we're seeing is more typical for homeowners is something in the kind of four kilowatt to six kilowatt range. And what we're finding when people do that is that things like electric vehicles become very attractive because you don't have to pay for gas. You don't have to pay for petrol all of a sudden. In most cases, you know, using the solar to heat that we are. So that kind of, that's kind of the size we're seeing more of um, now coming through. And we, we kind of expect it to continue with the planning, the removal of the planning restrictions, we'd expect people will be seeking to do this more and more. Like just to give a kind of a sense of build savings, like a small, a 10 panel system, 3.4 kilowatts, uh, Mari estimated that would probably save you 450 euro on your annual power bill for a residential home. Uh, that's That was on power prices that are probably about four months out of date, five months out of date. Yeah. So I'd say, you know, the savings better today. Um, I think Ruby made that point as well earlier about the, you know, it's a, it's a good, it was reasonable investment because I suppose it's worth commenting as well. Like the, the panels, they're now getting, we're now seeing warranties for 35 to 40 years. Basically manufacturers are saying they're going to last decades. So if you have something that pays for itself in five to eight years, you then have decades where it's there just generating power um, for free in effect. And just on that, you say decades, like one question is kind of just trying to see where, who it was from. But the life expectancy, like in terms of putting the business case in terms of mm. payback over a number of years, if you're saying typically, I think there was a mention of seven years there at one stage, mm. what life expectancy can you expect on the system? So I think like well, most of it, there's, there's not a lot of maintenance on the panels. You might need somebody to look at the electrical connections at some point, you know, so that's probably getting an electrician out. Uh, and most of the, a lot of the panel provider, a lot of like your, the installers will probably have an aftercare service. The, as we said, like the, the manufacturers are giving you warranties for 35 to 40 years for the panels before they need to be replaced, which suggests that they will last. You know, we would have traditionally said 25 years, about three or four years ago, but they've been working on extending the life, the life cycle of them. So they're now closer to 30, 35, maybe 40 in some cases. And just a question, because I I, I'm not... Not being cynical and asking, but I heard it asked before. In terms of decommissioning at the other end, will yeah. there be an issue with a, the, the products in terms of decommissioning whenever they, they, the device is spent? Yeah, so under the um, WE directive, which I'm sure you might be familiar with, the Waste Electrics yeah. directive, there is provision for basically contributions from industry towards recycling them at the end of their lives. We're at the point now where about, depending on whose estimate you believe, uh, the IEA, the International Energy Agency, says that we're, we're close about being able to recite about 95% of what goes into the solar array. Um, so they're pretty... They're, yeah, 25 years, won't be an issue recycling them. It's like the, that, that type of a narrative. There's no real basis to it. 
No, um, we're just we're because like in a sense like this was predicted, you know, like the way so that like there was there's a I think the scheme is called PV Cycle. It's there the um, We Ireland run it, so it's already there. There's European directives around the uh, the any of the people who bring the panels into the country, they're they're on the hook for this as well. So there's kind of legislative hooks for people to uh, ensure that they don't uh, they don't disappear. And that you know, there's prevent there's a two, fund, there's a fund there. Yeah, two practical questions that have come up, I suppose, uh, one from Nigel and one from Mark Morland. A three-phase electricity, like if you're on a three-phase system or single phase, is there what's the technical scenario there, I suppose? And secondly, in relation to buildings, a uh, farm buildings in terms of we'll say the weight of the panels or maybe even in storms or that. Is there any requirement in terms of specification of roofs to be able to, to take the panels? Um, I'll, I'll, I can jump in. And yeah, if you can jump uh, maybe, maybe in. Maybe if... Uh, Geraldine coming after. Yeah. Uh, sorry, so the first one was... Uh, apologies. Uh, three phase. Three phase, yeah. So how the solar system works essentially is it makes electricity, like it captures electricity in the panels, um, which is kind of direct current. And then there's a thing, it gets translated by an inverter into kind of AC to go onto the system. So how, what happens there is you have a sing, you can have a single phase inverter or a three phase inverter. So it's really about just making, you know, it would be just about putting in the right inverter in the system. So like if you went to Australia, for example, uh, if you went shopping for inverters, because it's, you know, solar is much more common there, you'd get, you'd have a sing, you'd have the single phase and three phase inverter just available. So it's just, you know, that, that's, just important. It's probably an important question to ask whomever is doing it. There, you you know, using the right yeah. inverter. And just as a question, because many people can't get connections like uh, for three phase. This I presume is not a route into three phase for someone uh, if they wanted to get three phase in the farm, but they're too far away from a connection. Well, it's still you're you're like the the big. I suppose it's kind of what I was trying to get at with the pilot scheme is that like at the minute ESB networks is still very much rationing access they're still kind of saying okay you can make an application and we'll have a think about it and then you know we will offer you a way to get physically connected we're probably uh, while we accept the point that the electricity system wasn't designed for this particularly the irish one there's a lot of capacity in the irish system we, we, we've over it and overbuilt it in a lot of cases so we think actually if they operated the system a bit smarter they'd be able to take all this power so we think there's a lot of um unnecessary bureaucracy in terms of preventing people getting onto the system and accessing it. So um, so, yeah. so your sense, and I'll come over to Ruby on this, uh, your sense is that the grid is fit to take it, but it's the bureaucracy that's stopping it more than, more than the, technically the, the grid capacity. Is that what you'd suggest? Me? Yeah, no, no, just saying that, uh, Connell, but yeah, if you maybe be, if you could answer that, Ruby, that'd be interesting, all right? Um, if I'm honest, I don't have the answer to that question, but I do know there is that it is something that has come up in one of our pilots where the farmer was trying to get access, kind of set up their solar system, their household was on a single phase system and their farm was on a, th a three phase system. And it was trying to develop something that actually could balance those two things and make sure what was developed was safe and um, was accessible and um, was fit for purpose, essentially. So these are all really good questions and really important questions. On the grid capacity perspective, I think that's probably uh, Connell's area of expertise more so than mine. And just in relation to that, if you're taking that a, a house is on one, let's say, MPRN and the farm is in another MPRN, is there, a, is there a straightforward system for managing linking into the two of them from the one system? Or how does that, I mean, that's a technical, that's a, an engineering question, is it? Just to just to be fair to it, because what happens, you, you know, I, I very specifically broke down all the different schemes by residential and non-residential for a reason, because yeah. that's the way the electricity system treats it. And that's the way the bureaucracy treats it. But I think Geraldine's, Geraldine made the point earlier, like from a, in a farm, in a like the difference between a farmyard and the farmhouse is a bit arbitrary in terms of the separation yeah. between the two. Like purely from an electrical, if you were an electrician, you could link up the two and that's not a problem. But because of the way all these schemes operate, they get connected separately and treated separately. So it's kind of a, it is a kind of a mindset thing as much as a physical connection thing. 
And just to, to move on, I suppose, John Dolan has a question in there, but I suppose it, it's to Paul Gosh and maybe to IFA as well, about audits and calling to farms and for farmers to get an understanding of their own situation. So maybe Ruby and Geraldine, if maybe both of you could just touch on that in terms of what's on offer, I suppose, in terms of giving people a bit of support or a bit of direction in terms of, as we've have been very clearly laid out, every situation is different. So the one thing people want is a bit of guidance, I suppose, and John's just asked the question in relation to that. Ruby, maybe from your perspective, if someone makes a call to yourself or someone similar to yourself, what, what can they, what advice can they get? So at the moment, what we're looking at is we're working with the IFA to develop kind of an application process where we would ask some specific for some specific information that would be useful for us in kind of understanding the suitability of their farm for solar and kind of what 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 maybe is possible. We'll request that information, we'll analyze it, we'll assess it, and then we'll work with kind of a team of installers to kind of go out, maybe do a perhaps do a desktop survey in the first instance, just to get that high level understanding. I think, think we've lost Ruby or else you've lost me much or which? No, she seems to have gone there. <laughs> and the site and undertake a cycle from a perspective of the profile, the orientation, the structural stability of the farm shed. Oh, sorry. Have I gone? Am I back? No, oh, you're, you're back. You're back. You're perfect. <laughs> oh, I was, I was, I, I don't know where I was. Uh, <laughs> where did I get cut off? Apparently, apologies. No, you're fine. You're fine. Yeah, that's it. As much as we want electricity, we also want broadband. But no, I think we, we caught most, most of what you said we're saying there. Uh, 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 Geraldine, from your perspective, can, uh, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, no, I just wanted to touch base on the connection and just something like that we are seeing and like the pilot project with it. The ESB networks have now for the first time established a so small scale generation manager. So we are seeing now resources going into that and that's very welcomed um, and hopefully um, through having dedicated resource there, we can start to develop a plan to, a, to address this because, you know, I, I, I think there's a, a, a fear, you know, as, as Colin said there, the system can take some, you know, additional. So we just need to work through what the concerns are, the barriers, and really facilitate that involvement. And that is key in relation in meeting the, the wider targets. So I think it's in everyone's best interest to start to try and work through and see what the system and what needs to do and start creating because it's a relatively short space of time when we have to ramp up that renewable energy. And I was at an, a conference yesterday with um, Environment Ireland and there's like, you know, they were saying that there's up to 50% of renewable energy is going to waste at the moment, you know, and that would be wind, not necessarily solar, but that's a phenomenal um, statistic if it's true and we really need to uh, start ensuring that our system can handle that um, look, obviously the, the battery I know there's a huge interest in there is a cost crunch there that Ruby has gone through um, and I th think for a lot of projects it's just not viable and selling back in even at the lower rate makes more sense and, and that's the reality here um, and we need to see where our system are and do we want to invest in that? We need to make decisions here at a national level. Do we want to allow certain projects to get into the grid? And are we going to invest in battery until we, you know, and we need to, to, to look at that and create that system and plan. And we're kind of missing that connection at the moment, I think, yeah. which is hugely important to the success. Just from your perspective, Geraldine, and it comes into just what you're saying there about the battery, the, the lack of funding schemes, and I know Tams has been mentioned before, and the idea of, let's say, selling back into the grid versus investments in on-farm kit that would allow that energy to be stored. Uh, one question that came in from Tom Fox, and just a clarification on this, but more so then to, to touch on Tams as well. With microgeneration, are you allowed, is it allowed under the acre scheme? I, I assume that I, you can maybe clarify that. Yeah, no, I, there's no issue with it because you're like, that's one of the things that came up there recently is with rooftop, there is no, like you're not taking away from biodiversity. It's it's a very, from a planning, it's it's a much easier uh system to adapt you've got the buildings there you have the structures already you're putting it on there's no um there may be as as in the safeguard zones there may be some in uh, glint or so you know within it but that's the only so there should be no issue at all under acres to have solar i'd see it as an advantage because you're reducing dependent on fossil fuels so but there should be no restriction column 
But, but starting with yourself, Geraldine, like you've made the point that 50% of the energy that's been, renewable energy that's been generated, certainly from, from wind, I think is a big part of it, is been, is not been used, if you like. And like in terms of grant schemes to fund or support, number one, what's needed, I suppose, number one, but equally, uh, where should the priorities be? Is it about making that battery system affordable or is it more about not going with grants for that and trying to get access to the grid? What is the... What is the thinking on that from policy perspective? From poli- I think it has to be maybe a mixture of both because we, we you know, we need we need that kind of plan and transparency of where our grid is. You know, pilot projects, as Colin said, are great, but it, it's it's kind of disheartening when we're we're seeing such a transition, such an interest. And yet we're still at the pilot phase. So we need to have, we have now targets for 2050. We have targets for 2030, 2050 for energy. We need to see that same understanding of what's required in the grid and access because we know that unless we can get that access and that funding from selling the excess a lot of projects are not going to be viable and that is a key key element to increasing the viability it's different if you're a high energy user you know you can see that viability but if you have a low energy use on your farm you may have a lot of space and a lot of potential there may be you may be dependent in the region on a huge amount of fossil fuels and it makes sense to decarbonize that economy you know we need to look at that um, but yet you don't have that energy use so do you prioritize those areas do you identify areas within the grid that can take that renewable energy projects and then do you grant aid batteries and elsewhere we just don't we need to have a greater understanding, a greater discussion on that. But I'd say probably you need both column, you know? Yeah, and I think that's that's very important. Like, I, I, it's it's the decision that has to be made where you, where you identify that battery storage is needed and where it's appropriate to sell back into the grid. I just, I'll come back to something in a second because I see there's a couple of questions coming in on that rooftop issue, but we'll just come back to it in a second. Just, Connell, uh, in relation to that question there about the, the spec and the capacity of the grid, what just take us through what considerations maybe need to be thought of there as regards that like is it realistic to say it's not about batteries it's about grid capacity the grid can take it or the grid has to be upgraded or is it more about the batteries because we're really not going to get there on the grid anytime soon just what's your sense of that okay yeah i suppose like it's kind of worth talking a little bit about what the grid looks like in a few years as well i maybe uh, sorry it's just a bit of context it'll be uh, like, you know, I suppose like the current grid is we burn dead dinosaurs from a few small power plants and then we push that power out. And that's what we built the system around. We're kind of moving to a different reality where, you know, you have farms, homes, businesses all generating their own power, using some themselves, pushing some out of the system. Then you have this kind of bigger national system that has like wind and solar kind of working in tandem and storage moving that around. Then you have like this offshore network, offshore wind, hydrogen. So that's a system that is very, it's, it's, it's getting bigger and it's also getting more decentralized at the same time. So there, there's two things, I've got, there's the two dimensions to operating that system are one, there, you do need more infrastructure. There's no getting around it. So it's planning for that and beginning to build that network today so that by the time we're all there, we'll be able to reinforce it. So it's doing the studies, doing the work, kind of understanding where all the demand and all this. What stuff. time frame are you talking about for that sort of grid upgrade type scenario? Well, to be honest, like it should have started already. Um, the the thing we've done, we've we've seen now multiple grid plans. They, to be honest, it's kind of pretty clear which areas the grid need reinforcement. Like you look at all the different scenarios. There's there's upgrades that happen in a lot of those scenarios. So we'd say start with those ones and then see where you get to moving beyond that. Um, The other side of it is managing the system a bit smarter. So we currently have a very conservative standard. And the the way I put it is we design our system for a windy, sunny night. So we go maximum renewables output. That's everything going. So that's um, a sunny hurricane. uh, In the and low demand middle of the night. So that that's what we're designing the system for. And that me while that's problematic in some ways, what it does mean is there's spare capacity in there because everyone's, because when you build these connections, we've all built, you, you go out to some of these places and you'll see like these substations. So I was on a farm last week where a farmer themselves have built like a utility scale wind project and they've also built a solar farm and they had one point of connection to the grid. They're right beside each other. You know, it's one field there, one field there. 
and they've had to build two substations for a piece of kit, you know, big concrete structure, foundations, everything for a piece of kit that could have easily filled in the back of the other one. There's a lot of that kind of stuff where we're just a little too conservative in how we do it. And there's a lot of inefficiency. So if you take it back to a farm level and a farmer yeah. making a decision or a householder making a decision, like should they basically should they wait for the bus to come that is the grid upgrade or should they consider going down the road with battery because realistically like in practical terms how far away is it do you, do you reckon just by the yeah i mean the the deployment to grid's been a bit big problem you know in ireland building the network so there's there's two sides you're quite one is demand forces the hand a little bit so if there are a lot of farmers who are really interested in this making those applications of dsb networks that forces esb networks hand in terms of okay we need to do something here uh, at the individual farm level though yeah you should always i i wouldn't be making a plan for a kind of a rooftop system i wouldn't be making a plan for okay when that grid gets built in 10 years over there kind of uh, that's that just doesn't seem a very feasible thing to ask people to do um but uh, kind of as ruby said though in a lot of cases you know, it's it's going to tend to make more sense to consume currently most of what you produce just because it's, um, you know, like what you, if you think about like the, the, the retail price, the price you pay is the price of it's made over there, gets pushed down all these wires and then I use it or what I make myself for free. That's, you know, that's kind of the, the equation. So the is the case, in some cases that battery might work. Yeah, but it'll yeah. depend. Sorry. Is it a case of coming in at a level where you're taking out, let's say, 60% of your usage and relying on the network for the top up so that your, your level of usage, your, your, your basic level, your lo lower tier level that's consistent all day, if you like? Or is it like, is, is, there, a, is there a way of looking at this that's a percentage of your usage? I'd, I'd, I'd love to give you just an easy number, but the truth is there probably isn't. But like the principle of what you're saying makes a lot of sense. You know, if I can even use this to take out, say it's 50, 60, 80 percent of my bill, that's a good day's work. You know, so then maybe it's just the 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 reality is like meeting our energy needs in the future. You know, someone we were someone I was talking to someone the other day and they said it's not there's never going to be one answer. It's going to be a mosaic. Unfortunately, that makes it complex, <laughs> but yeah. there is, it, but it does involve thinking about it in the perhaps and you know looking at partial solutions, not just full solutions. I'll put this out to all three of you. Just John uh, Munley there is asking. Just a, a ready retinue rule of thumb in terms of let's say a panel or two panels in terms of the the, the power they generate. Is there a is there a rule of thumb in terms of what typically you can you can size out? your capacity from your, your number of panels or what way does that work? So the panels are sized accordingly. So if you want X kilowatt hours from your system, you'll you'll put the number of panels in place, but it will depend on the manufacturer and what's provided by them. But there's no there's no let's say X square meters delivers so much, not not particularly the different ones of different capacities. Current Currently, like you'd say, so the 2.4 kilowatt system would fit within your 12 square meters. If that gives it, that's helpful. The thing is, though, like, you know, panel, the panel technology is improving. So, you know, a couple of years ago, one panel was 300 watts. Now it's 500 watts. I think I saw that in one of the questions. So, like, you know, they're basically what they're trying to do. They're always trying to pack more into more bang for your buck per meter squared. So, like, I think one of the things that really surprised me is how quickly the space is moving. So the, in terms of the relative efficiency, so your system in a year is probably going to be more efficient than your system today. Yeah. No, in fairness to all, I fully appreciate you can't give technical answers in a moving situation, but just to give people a sense of, and I think that answer gives people a fair sense of, of a, a rule of thumb, if you like, in general terms. Just in getting back to the, the, the question that... that Mark Morning and indeed Fraser Rothwell has asked about the farm sheds and uh, the frames and the structures. I, I don't know, maybe Geraldine, Geraldine from the IFA perspective, has there been any work done in terms of identifying that? My understanding is that the kit is quite light. So has it impact or, or has that been looked at from your perspective? No, I suppose Ruby said like that they've come across some instances with the proof of concept project 
Like I know within uh, TAMS they have, and we'll probably maybe see some visibility within TAMS, they have said subject to safety precautions. So you may see within that now, um, you know, some additional clarity on what it is. But as you said, the systems are light. I've seen them in all sheds on you, you know what I mean? So it's not necessarily that, you know, it is a light system. Um, it just uh, it we don't have any, but there any specific well, recommendations. By and large, there's no significant issues of emerge essentially. Uh, no, other than like kind of I say the asbestos is probably one of the big ones, you know, yeah. in old old. But we have not had, um, I, you know, there's been no issues where most of them have been have been able to be put up. So there's been it hasn't come back column as an issue around the place that there are increasing you know that we can't get them up the shed isn't suitable that hasn't become a, a, an issue or isn't isn't a common an issue there actually it was just ruby's comment on the asbestos which makes sense was kind of the first issue i'd heard in relation to that yeah, yeah and a- access is a big one as well so safety the access to like get your scaffolding in place maybe checking it out making sure it's all work that's really important the orientation are you going what direction are the roofs orientate orientated um and also the profile of the roof so is it is that optimal kind of 35 to 45 degrees of the profile is most suited that one is one that will just change the will just change the kind of payback period but it's it's safety access making sure that it is structurally stable so it's not per se you know it has to be this or that but it's got a wooden shed that maybe is not as in as good shape as it looks as safe as it could be that there where we would see problems and again yeah Geraldine the asbestos one is is quite a quite and would be a blocker I suppose and just when you mentioned that Ruby like the the angle the let's say the direction of your shed which way it's facing whether it be south southeast southwest eh, and equally locations around the country I think is there there's a difference in terms of different like let talk about sites and is there anything in terms of people should know as regards that end of it yeah, I think so. In the southeast of Ireland, you're going to get the most irradiance from the sun. So I think I'm trying to think of an example where I think it was like a one, let's say one kilowatt installation would generate. I'm, I'm going to say the wrong numbers. Maybe it was a 10 kilowatt installation would generate 1,150 in the southeast. The same size would generate eight to 900 euro in the northwest of the country. So those. Those kind of things all come into play. But again, they're all things that if we, for example, went out, we did our serve site survey on your farm we would do those calculations we give you that understanding of what actually is reasonable and what is realistic and it doesn't it, there's no rule to say you have to have it on one side than the other you could have panels on two sides of a of a shed roof to kind of get as the sun moves get to kind of maximize your benefit so everything is kind of not everything but most things are flexible and can be tailored to suit a specific farm so it's not really about having a south facing roof. It can be, let's say, facing somewhat southeast or east or west. That's still it, it's not that big of an issue then, is it? It it just it just impacts your payback period. You're still going to generate some electricity from your panel. It's just not going to be as much. And it's just considering that when you're kind of making your investment. Mm-hmm. The um consumer protection legislation also means that they're the supplier they're not allowed over to over promise so they have to give you um as best as they can a reasonably accurate assessment of what it produces so there's some protections there as well and in terms coming from your perspective in terms of a, a consumer that's looking to go to try or a farmer that's looking to, go to to looking at their options like is there any let's say external perspective or ready reckoner or kind of touch to touchstone that they can go to if you like to just put everything in perspective yeah i i think like it's it's it feels a bit like the farming community has been a little underserved by like say somebody like seai which is what you'd normally say to people you know independent statutory authority there was actually a good piece done in the farmer's journal um not too long ago where they did a kind of assessments and modeling of um different farms and different systems uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to remember the date now. It was a while ago, but it was probably it's not a bad starting point because they the 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 journalist uh, I can't remember the journalist's name. Sorry, but uh, mm-hmm. they did some work there. So I think start with SEAI Chagask uh, have done a huge amount of work on solar PV actually, and um, so there's some good people in there as well. It might be worth picking up the phone to your Chagask advisor and seeing if you can get a you know chat with somebody. Who, who, but, but, who, who like me doesn't represent the solar industry 
<laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but, but in fairness to you, Geraldine, I know in, in fairness to you and your organisation, there is an effort uh, at that level equally to, to advise and inform farmers. I don't know if you want to make a comment. Yeah, like what we're finding out at the moment is we would kind of, if people are interested and looking uh, with the, we're, we're getting a number of queries, we would pass it on to the member services. And as Ruby said, they would then uh, ask for some information information and then there could be an initial just review of kind of is you know where you are like I think with all of these things called like I, I know and I think it will, it's great to have these discussions because you're kind of okay can we provide some initial very broad scale guidance you know if people are kind of where you should forget about it it's not going to work or you know or or let's let's invest a bit of time here and, and look at the system um so, uh, but look, I think if anybody's interested, there is that service available that we can look at it and see where you are with it. I do think, yeah, look, it is, it is a big issue at the moment that there's a huge interest, but getting that kind of practical information and, you know, the fact that it one size doesn't fit all um, is just making it a little bit more complex. But I think Colin made a very good point as well. And I'd say it as a forester, when everyone, you know, it's a new business to you uh, to shop around, to talk to as many people as you can. Like you should talk to your child advisor. You should talk to us. We'll talk to, talk to everyone that you can, you know, within reason, give a couple of companies and you know within a very short space of time you'll have a, a very understanding based on your business how many you know what kind of enterprise do you have so um you know there are a number of things and look i will following this look at putting maybe a, a list together of where people can go on our website you know of companies of different things that would just be an access point um to Absolutely. them uh and we'd be happy also to circulate to like it that around yeah. Kevin that's on the webinar as well. Yeah. Just one question that's coming up from Bernard. Uh, we didn't get his surname, but in terms of restricted supply of equipment, I suppose in reality, a lot of, well, at least the suggestion is that a lot of the kit is coming from China. And in the current in the current political or, or climate, you just don't know, I suppose. Um, what is the story, the story as regards supply of equipment? Is there a shortage currently? Is there potentially a shortage uh, I don't know uh, who wants to take that question. I don't know, maybe Connell or... I'm, uh, I'm, happy, I'm happy to take a swing at it and sure Ruby can uh, <laughs> let me know if I've missed anything. Um, yeah, no, so... Uh, uh, yeah, there, there's basically... Globally, solar is the most popular renewable technology in the world, so we've seen huge interest, and that, that's meant that you've had kind of supply for the product, uh, you know, being outstripped by the demand... What, there's definitely been a there's a the kind of big discussion in Europe and the industry right now is very much on we don't really want to replace a dependence out with Putin with a dependent uh, dependence on um, the Communist Party in China. So what we have been seeing is that the um, is that the European Union is driving a lot of change around kind of bringing home a lot of manufacturing capacity. Um, the uh, in the United States as well, ha under the Inflation Reduction Act, so another IRA, but slightly different to our one, have um, they're spending trillions on building up kind of low carbon manufacturing capability as well. So we're probably seeing a lot more kind of coming to Europe and North America. Um, in terms of the scale, the most forecasts are now predicting that there'll be an easing in the supply constraint next year. Because what's happening is essentially that the manufacturers are ramping up because they're seeing the demand for what they want. So I've seen one manufacturers, they're increasing their output 33% um, in one year. And that's not... Um, Just to put a bit of context, I see another question coming in from Joe Healy there. And he's talking about 80% of our solar panels coming from China. And I know you're talking about we're trying to wean ourselves off that dependency. Mm. Like... What level of capacity is being talked about in, in Europe or America? Will it be will we be able to take that down significantly, do you think? Yeah, the expectation I think the expectation is to kind of get that down to so get that number a lot down, um, with the intent that they'd be kind of trying to maximize supply in Europe and America themselves. The Americans kind of went into a trade war, they're going to do it themselves largely. Um, that's that's what they're targeting, and we'll probably be encouraging them to kind of send some the European way. They're building, um, the, there's a number of large factories being built in the European continent at the minute. And again, the, ten, the intent is really to try and reduce that dependence. 
Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a little up in the air at the minute because it's, it's live geopolitics, but that's... And just, and just to add to that, oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, Ruby. I was just going to add to that. There's, there is another issue with the panels that are largely coming from China. So I think it's 90% of the materials that are used, the polycrystalline materials that are used within the panels or it's the silicon are produced... Um, in what is termed as modern day slavery that is based in China. So that's another thing which I guess as board got energy we can offer. We're going through quite a thorough procurement process where they're quite, you know, the big questions we are asking. And it's really part of that process, making sure what we get is ethical. So in addition to the trade stuff, the geopolitical stuff, it's that they're coming from like that, that is a real place. issue. There's a, there, there's a yeah. real possibility that that supply could be cut off for, for human rights reasons. Like, and if well, that happens, we're, we're quite exposed to that. Yeah, well, a lot of invest that in what's happening really at the kind of at the European level, because it kind of needs to happen at that kind of scale, is that there's a real intent. Investors, uh, companies like uh, Ruby's are really driving for we want a clean supply chain, we want a transparent yeah. supply chain, we want to know where this came from. We want to be sure it's come from ethical uh, concerns. And I think if, you know, if that means we have to pay a little bit more for our panels, we're OK with that. Um, so I think like it's it's becoming it's it's probably one of the biggest issues in the in, in the sector at the minute. And we're, we're trying to deal with it. Yeah. Just a question here. And it's probably too technical for the day. We might do the maths and send it back after. But Gary's asking if you use a 15,000 kilowatt hours, uh, 60% during the day and 40% at night, heat pump installed, what? Anyone has a guess at what level of capacity they should be thinking of putting in? <laughs> that sounds like a quotation for Ruby. but uh... I, yeah, I think I'll, 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 I'll put that one on for another time. <laughs> that, that's fine. That's why I think I just look at there. I said I'd ask. Uh, but uh, basically, yeah, that, now I'm just drifting down through here and checking them. Uh, in terms of the kit on, uh, no, one question here actually from Raymond Brady. In late, he, he is an example of a six kilowatt turbine on his farm. And uh, obviously it's not a solar, but it's it's wind turbine. And he's supplying back into the grid. He wants to know when will he get, he has a smart meter already installed. Like, is he going to get credit for this or not? Uh, or when is he going to get a meaningful payment for this? Is like, is there any progress in terms? This is back to supplying onto the grid. I know people are supplying to the grid are very meager figures at the moment. Where are we with actually rewarding people effectively for the electricity or supply they're going to supply back into the grid? Can I know uh, maybe if Connell from a policy perspective, maybe Geraldine as well? Any perspectives on this? So on the if it's if it's linked to your residential supply, you're from the 1st of July, you're eligible to be um, received backdated payments. You've been credited back, assuming it was installed before February this year, you should be able to receive credits or some sort of recognition of it up uh, from February. Uh, so that's if it's the residential. If it's the non-residential, we're still waiting to see a lot of the detail on that, to be honest. Um, so we're still waiting for the policy clarity. Um, but the scenario would be backdated to February. Yep. Yeah. So, and, and is it expected that something similar will come on board in terms of the non-residential? We haven't seen that detail yet, but I'm sure Geraldine might have more visibility on it than myself. Uh, Geraldine, do you want to comment? No, I haven't. Had, I, I know that they, there it, it is being considered, um, the rates or how it's going to do, how it's going to operate, but it is something that uh, is, is being looked at within, within that whole smart metering. So, uh, but again, as Con said, we don't have the visibility on it, but we will, we're, pu we're pushing for that. Um, uh, and, and having that same ability. So, yeah, that, that's really where it is at the moment. We were hoping to be done, and as we had set a target for now in 15 minutes, so we were possibly another five minutes or so in terms of a, a just a, where we're at. It just in relation to tree phase, a Caroline Farrell, is the pricing of tree phase electric with bigger transformer very negative? Like, is there an issue around the tree phase if you're... If you're, if you're Larger requirement for a transformer, or I don't know if I think wish to take that. Is this around the G10 relay point? Uh, the, well? the G10 Nigel has come in with the G10 relay as well. Uh, that seemingly like a bigger requirement. Uh, it, it, Technical it, questions beyond my my. my yeah, I, I can give. I'll give you my idiot's understanding of it, and uh, that that'll be a, 
I, you know, I don't do the physical install. Um, a lot of my, it's kind of back to the conservatism. A lot of my, the guys who do the installations or a lot of the electrical uh, engineers, my uh, acquaintance seem of the opinion that it's unnecessary and it's not needed. It, it, ESB networks deem it as a required protection once you get above a certain level. So obviously it does add to the cost. One of the challenges with it is not just the cost, but it also increases the timeline because there's a piece of kit that has to be ordered in a lot in some cases. So it mightn't be sitting in a warehouse somewhere so it can lengthen the project. So like it's kind of part of that bigger, smarter operation of the system and perhaps being less conservative in our standards. And in terms of, let's say, grant schemes and the like, is it kit like that that should be supported uh, or, or is that would, would kit like that qualify for the current grant schemes are we aware of uh, no I think the panels would but not the um, any of the associated stuff like that and I think that's probably something we need to look at just on the getting back to the, the grant side of it again because one question that has come up as relation to TAMS and I know Geraldine probably you'd be the first to come in on this this idea that a uh, I know because I was dealing with here in the Parliament there on Monday evening where we put a put a forward a, an oral motion that, that the incentivization of solar energy through grants and other supports shouldn't be precluded from being sold onto the grid. Is this an issue or is this being resolved in terms of there's a suggestion, I think, of a competition law where anything that was granted through TAMS uh, cannot can't uh, be supplied onto the grid versus something that hasn't been granted, uh, a competition issue in relation to that. Geraldine, have you any clarity around that or what's your yeah. own sense? No, that there, there has been. We, we, we understood it as part of that kind of rural development regulation column on that it was agricultural for agricultural use only and there was a limitation within that. Um, I'd say uh, the competition, uh, I'd say as well, uh, is, is, is definitely an issue there. And I suppose that's why we have within one of our proposals is like that if we, you know, if we see that we have limitations under TAMS, is TAMS the right mechanism to be funding this on, on farm? Um, and should we be looking at developing a small scale solar farm generation that will allow that selling? Because, you know, we do see that on certain farm types, it's, you know, it, that, that the additional, the viability of being able to sell and getting an export price is essential to the viability of those projects. They can generate a lot of, elect of renewable energy. It's just they don't have the energy use on on their own on their own um, farm. So that that needs to be you know it's, it, the Thames is great there. It, it, the sixty percent is very welcomed. The inclusion of the farm and that'll increase the numbers that it'll make sense for. But there's still a cohort you know, that can produce a lot of energy that have a lot of roof space that you know that need that export premium the, the micro generation is there we'll see how that works um and i'd be interested to, to see the payback my understanding is the payback is still very long with the level of grant that's there under the micro generation scheme so you'd need to see an, an increase within that for farm buildings but um from a yeah. from a lobby perspective like is it a case that it's seo should be coming forward with a more comprehensive scheme at farm level and take it completely yeah, I absolutely believe that, Colm. I think Colm mentioned it as well. There, there isn't a huge amount of supports there for farmers, particularly when we look at the scale and the potential, be it like we're only looking at one particular aspect here today uh, in relation to micro generation. We're only looking at rooftop solar. There's on-farm solar, you know, there's AD, there's a whole wider potential here within. Um, so, and, and we, we, we need to get that kind of the information, the supports there. Um, and I think like that's, uh, and, and developing a system that improves the efficiency and doesn't ensure any wastage of the, the uh, renewables produced. Sure. I just want to come in as well on the transformer and, and the grant for that. Look, that's a net that comes back to the network and that comes back uh, to, you know, the, and the delays and planning and access um, and, and trying to, you know, so you're trying to get a decision and then if you get a decision, there's an investment. So I'm not sure. I think that, you know, there is a huge cost. There's absolutely no doubt and it can take away the, from a viability of a project, but that's going to have to be done in consultation with the network. That's going to have to be done as part of this building 
building the network to to to, to handle that decentralization you know of of energy producers but surely one of the things and that's where the like of SEI and I see Larry Stripe coming in here in relation to it like if we can decentralize almost our storage a small bit of storage everywhere surely that strengthens the overall capacity and resilience of of the overall grid and the overall network I don't know maybe Connell you could throw a comment in, in relation to that like, is, should it, does it not make sense to grant aid and support micro storage, we'll say, in different parts of the country that actually balances up our grid a lot more? And should the like of SEI not be coming on board to make that happen? I, I, you'd need to do the figures on that column. I don't like, and I'd be, I think it's a very interesting, and I'd say Ruby has those figures as part of that proof of concept. And these are one of the reasons that we've been involved in that is that the, you know, in this proof of concept is yeah. there's, there are unknowns and we wanted, um, we, we wanted to be able to, you know, by actually physically developing projects on the ground with farmers, we, we would get a better sense of those barriers and the barriers to, you know, what's, you know, you can't, what are, what's the viability of projects and what's needed to increase and, and upscale that. So that's very much the thinking behind this work. And just, Conor, from, from a policy perspective, does it not make sense to invest in, in supporting, the, like a storage in particular, that would add to the capacity and, the, if you like, the distribution of the grid? I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I suppose, like, the direction of travel in a lot of ways is towards kind of increasingly localising the kind of um, how we balance the grid, you know, moving towards a kind of more regional approach or more, you know, even county level approach in terms of how we balance supply and demand. And like, to be honest, a lot of the technical solutions are probably there, thereabouts. It's really about going after them in a full-throated manner. You know, I, I know I know it sounded very highfalutin when I talked about like that system of the future, but that's where we're going. So let's just start making the investments today and kind of identifying, you know, there's, there's parts of the grid where we know there's a problem. So it's really about kind of how do we make these things happen faster? We're doing a lot of kind of pilots under something called the National Networks Local Connections Program, which is fantastic. But we just need to roll things out, try them, learn the lessons and just, you know, keep going. Where I've seen a lot of reports uh, coming out of these various pilots. <laughs> I'd like to see some more physical kit being put in place. No, look, look thanks for that. Uh, just, I suppose where we're at, uh, with probably time to wrap up in the next couple of minutes. Uh, I would say to each of the speakers, maybe... I'll start with you, Connell, because we started the last time. Just a nugget to leave everyone with, or a, a, a point of reflection, and the overall, an overall bigger picture talk to leave people with. Ultimately, it, se- it seems to me, anyway, that when you look at all the discussions around emissions, uh, changing age profile in farming, the economic difficulties in farming, like it seems like solar ticks us some of those boxes and can really help in that kind of transition. So I suppose just at a general level, solar and agriculture seem like natural partners to me and it's something we want to accelerate. I'll stop there. Yeah. Um, Ruby? Yeah, I would totally agree with that. And like, I think as well, I've, I've previously worked in the research and development funding space, so governments incentivizing companies to invest in innovation. And having worked directly with farming companies with kind of, you know, De Laval and all these companies, it just shows what funding can do to incentivize people to kind of come up with really smart ideas, this virtual power plant of the future. And I think it's just a really interesting space to be involved in. And I, I think it's quite an optimistic space to be involved in, to be honest. Hey, Charlie. Yeah, look, I would I would agree with uh, the the two other speakers as well. But I think look, we we have um, a lot of targets here. We need to make it viable at farm level. We need uh, and we need to look within and optimize the usage of of our buildings. You know, we need to optimize. It. It's a rooftop solar is an excellent way to generate renewable energy. It doesn't impact in any way in, you know, we're preparing a submission on biodiversity here. We're not taking land out of agriculture. We're not taking land to, to, to produce this energy. We're using buildings there, but we need to ensure that the model is there and we need to actively, and we need to develop the model around. It's a different, you know, farms are particularly, you know, there's a lot of farms that where they have space to do this, 
but it, there, there's a financial vulnerability and the model needs to work and be ad- address that and it needs to be long term sustainable for, for, for farmers. So I think the bottom line from the, the overall conversation is there's enormous potential in this sector at farm level in particular, and indeed at domestic level as well. But the investment needs to be put into it in in the proper ways and the the research done done as well. I suppose from my own perspective, just in relation to that that TAMS issue, I've been working here in Brussels in terms of to try and get that that, uh, issue around the incentivization of of, uh, solar power and the ability to sell that back to the grid through, if if you've been incentivized by TAMS and allowing people to sell that back. That, that's been looked at at the European level. We put it through the Agriculture Committee. Hopefully, it'll, it'll move on as well in terms of the other the other area, the, the other stages, if you like, to go to a full plenary, and maybe we can get moving with the Commission in relation to that. Just in general, I, I, I certainly think it's been, I'd like to thank the three speakers for your contributions today. Look, nobody has the perfect answers. It's a, it's a work in progress. But I think certainly you've educated everybody in the broader principles and broader concepts of, of of a oh, oh, where solar is at. I think Geraldine mentioned about the other options that are available. Well, it's their intention to, to have similar webinars looking at the alternatives as well. So please tune in again when we do ones about the, the various other options, whether it be anaerobic digestion or other similar options that are out there at farm level. So I think we over the next couple of months, we aim to tease through a number of different options. Just to say in relation to today, anyone who registered for the webinar, we will have a recording of it and we will be sending a link out to, to the various people as well that, that, that have a, a lot of registered for the event. I think we do, we do around 200, over 200 people I think registered between the various platforms and well over 100 on, on board through the platforms as well. So I'd like to thank everyone for, for engaging with us. And any specific questions, technical questions, we will have them, uh, we will, if you like, have them captured behind the scenes and we'll try and get back to people them as well. So look at all to say to thank the three panelists again, thank the audience for their engagement, and hopefully we'll catch up again in another element of micro-generation at farm level. Thank you very much.